Good day. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic we're going to discuss friezes. Now, a friezes is any pattern that is repeated horizontally, usually meant as some form of decoration. They have, however, a very surprisingly ancient past which we're going to look at. In this time, however, it was noticed that there are certain similarities or symmetries that appear over and over again. We're going to see that we can organize these symmetries into one of seven symmetry groups and every single frieze will contain the characteristics of one of these seven groups. Once we've described these seven groups, we will then see how we can take an arbitrary pattern and convert it into a frieze satisfying the conditions of each of those groups. So again, a frieze is any pattern that is repeated horizontally, usually meant to decorate buildings, walls, often the walls of kitchens, doorways, fireplace mantles, window sills, and often the uh, the edges of tablecloths. Now here we see some de friezes decorating buildings in Alcobasa, Battaglia, and Monsanto. Here's some further friezes. Here we see a sarcophagus in Alcobasa decorated with a frieze. Here we see friezes in Tamar, or at the University of Coimbra, or an old monastery in San Fins. Friezes are also very popular with cast iron work. Now here's some very beautiful friezes from some of the churches in Quebec City. These are exceptionally ornate and very beautiful. Here's some further friezes. Here a frieze decorates the top of one of the gates of Quebec City. And on the right hand side we see a hotel that uses not a horizontal frieze, but a vertical frieze. Now, friezes are exceptionally popular in Washington, D.C., decorating the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, a war memorial, and in this case, the ceiling of the Lincoln Memorial. Not all countries use friezes that often. This is the only example of a frieze decorating a building that I have a photo of from Iceland. Now, in a real pinch, you can even use human skulls to create a frieze, as I do here, in Evora, Portugal. Now, I said that friezes have a long and ancient past. Here we see a Roman mosaic that is bordered by a frieze. More recently, the Dome of the Rock, built in 691 CE, has numerous very beautiful friezes decorating both the interior and the exterior of that building. The Temple of Athena was built in 438 BCE, and here a frieze decorates the top of the building. Now a full-scale replica of this temple was built in Nashville in 1931, and here you can see the full effect of the frieze. Now it's not technically a frieze because the frieze only forms the pattern for a sequence of windows, and within each of these windows is a different scene from Greek mythology. However, the basic design is still a frieze, as is the pattern or the edging at the top of the roof. Now here we see a frieze of flowers and other decorations at Persopolis. This was the capital of the Achaemenid Empire from approximately 500 BCE. Here we see the Ishtar Gate from Babylon. It was commissioned by King Nebuchadnezzar II in approximately 575 BCE. Even older, this inscription is believed to commemorate a festival for Pharaoh, Snef Pharaoh Sneferu in approximately 2600 BCE. At the bottom of this inscription is a frieze of five pointed stars. However, this is the most interesting. A small okra crayon that was found in the Blombos Caves Cave of South Africa. This very simple etched pattern is believed to be 75,000 years old. And this pattern appears to be the oldest example of deliberate human art. So here we see the artist copying a sequence of lozenges. And we can translate each lozenge over one period to make another copy right next to the this distance is said to be one period. However, there are other properties as well as we can notice. I can take this 
pattern and reflect it horizontally and I get back the same freeze. I can reflect the pattern vertically through this, through this line and I will get the same freeze back. And I can also rotate it 180 degrees and I get the exact same freeze back. Now, these properties are called symmetries. We're going to be able to describe freezes by what symmetries they have and they do not what symmetries they do not have. Not all freezes have all symmetries. For example, the stars on that ancient Egyptian inscription have contain only horizontal symmetry. Likewise, the Persian frieze has only horizontal symmetry. In fact, most cast ironwork fences that you see have only horizontal symmetry. The flowers on the Ishtar gate, however, are 16 petaled and therefore have not only translational symmetry, but horizontal symmetry, vertical symmetry, and rotational symmetry. Now, one thing you might notice is that if you have vertical symmetry or a vertical reflection and either horizontal symmetry or rotational symmetry, you must have the other as well. It is not possible to have a freeze that has vertical symmetry, horizontal symmetry, without rotational symmetry. The lions on the Ishtar gate, on the other hand, do not have any symmetries other than translational symmetry. There are no reflections nor rotations possible. Now here's a very common freeze. For example, out here in front of the Lincoln Memorial. We have translational symmetry, but we also have rotational symmetry. However, there are no reflected reflections. Now the Roman mosaic freeze almost has rotational symmetry. However, the artisan decided to highlight one of the edges of each of the patterns. That highlight breaks the symmetry. So now if we rotate it 180 degrees, the highlight appears at the top of the frieze. Now this is a simplification of one of the friezes on the Dome of the Rock. We can translate this, we can reflect it horizontally, and we can rotate it as well. However, we cannot reflect it vertically. What we can, however, do is we can take this freeze and shift it over half a period. We can then take that freeze, that shift, and reflect it vertically. This is called a glide symmetry, or a glide reflection, and we will represent it by that symbol there. So therefore, every single freeze must have translational symmetry. You can always take the freeze and move it one period to the left or to the right. Other possible symmetries are horizontal symmetry, vertical symmetry, rotational symmetry, or glide symmetry. Now, every freeze may or may not have one of these four subsequent symmetries, and therefore that gives us a possibility of having 2 to the 4 or 16 possible combinations. However, not all combinations are unique. If you have translational symmetry and vertical symmetry, then you must have glide symmetry as well. As we noted before, if you have translational symmetry with horizontal symmetry and vertical symmetry, you must also have rotational symmetry and because you do have vertical symmetry, you must also have glide symmetries. Similarly, if we have translational, rotational, and vertical symmetry, we must also have horizontal and glide symmetries. We're going to look at all possible combinations and we're going to describe each of these combinations using letters of the Latin alphabet. If we want to consider the freeze that is translation only, we're going to use the letter B. Here the period is one character and if you look closely you will see that there are no reflections or rotations possible. If we now take the letters B and D and repeat these, we now have a period of two characters and we see that we can reflect this horizontally. In fact, within every period you're guaranteed that there are always two lines of reflection. If we look at the letters B, P, we notice that there's also a period of two characters, 
but we cannot rotate nor can we reflect this pattern. We can, however, again, shift the freeze over by half a period and then reflect this shifted freeze vertically. That gives us a glide symmetry. If we look at the letters BQ, we notice that we have translational symmetry and 180 degree rotational symmetry. The period is still two characters. There are no reflections. However, every period does contain two points of rotational symmetry. If we truncate the stem off of the D or the Q, we get the letter A. If we repeat this pattern, we get a period of one character. That guarantees that we have vertical symmetry. And, of course, if we have vertical symmetry, we must also have glide symmetries or glide reflections. If we remove the stem altogether, that leaves us the letter O. Repeating this horizontally, we have a period of one character. There is vertical and therefore glide symmetries. And there is, uh, there is horizontal symmetry. Again, every period has two axes of rotation, uh, two, axi two lines of reflection. And we can rotate this 180 degrees to get back the original. And every period has two points of rotational symmetry. Finally, let's look at the seventh. The letters B, D, P, Q in alphabetical order. Here the period is four characters. Like B, P, it does have a glide symmetry or a glide reflection. So we can move it over half a period, two characters in this case, and reflect it vertically. In this case, however, we also have horizontal reflections, again, with two lines of reflection within each period, and we also have 180 degree rotational symmetry, again, with two points of rotational symmetry within each period. We can therefore describe the seven freeze symmetry groups by the letters B, BD, BP, BQ, AO and BDPQ. And these contain all possible common, these are all possible symmetry groups. Now, the International Union of Crystallography has designations for each of these. And we'll notice that P1 indicates that there is no rotational symmetry, while P2 indicates the presence of rotational symmetry. If there is horizontal symmetry, the third character is a letter M. If that is missing, the third character is 1. If we had glide symmetry without vertical symmetry, we see the letter G. And if we have vertical symmetry, we must therefore also have glide symmetry. In that case, it's represented by the letter M. The absence of both vertical and glide symmetries are represented by the number one in the fourth location. Now, I said there were two to the sixteen, two to the four equals sixteen possible patterns or combinations of symmetries. What happened to the remaining nine? Well, if I already have horizontal symmetry and glide symmetries, then I must at the very least also have rotational symmetry. If I notice that I have horizontal symmetry and rotational symmetry, then at the very least I must also have glide symmetries and I should inspect further to look for horizontal symmetries. With horizontal and vertical symmetries, we notice that we have all possible combinations or all possible symmetries. Horizontal, glide, rotational, and vertical. Likewise, if I have these three, I must have all of them. Same with this combination. And if I have glide symmetries and rotational symmetries, at the very least, I'm guaranteed that there must also be horizontal symmetry. As we said before, if we have only 
vertical symmetry, then we at the very least must also have glide symmetries. And if we have rotational and vertical symmetry, we must have all of the symmetries. Of course, if we add one more to the left-hand side, we must still have all possible symmetries. So it is impossible to create a frieze that contains only these two symmetries, or perhaps only rotational and glide symmetries. Other symmetries will always exist. Now, how do you create a frieze pattern satisfying the symmetry group that you're looking for? Well, we're going to start with an arbitrary asymmetric shape. In this case, I've chosen a script letter D and one of the wreaths from the United Nations flag. Now, if we want to create a translation-only frieze, all we have to do is choose a period. And the choice of period will affect what the frieze looks like. If we want to add horizontal symmetry, we'll just take one of the friezes that is translationally symmetric, choose a line of horizontal symmetry, and you've noticed I've moved each of them just slightly apart from the other, we will now reflect these horizontally. You'll notice that the patterns are significantly different. Not very different, but there are differences. Here we see more or less closed loops. Here we see a point within each cycle. Here we see a closed wreath and an open wreath. Now, if we want translational and vertical symmetries, or reflections, again, we're going to start with a frieze that has translational symmetry only. For each of these, I will then choose a line of vertical, vertical reflection. I will then reflect these patterns, and once again, I get significantly different results in all of the cases. If I want translations with 180 degree rotations, I again, I start with a frieze that has translation only symmetry, and then I choose, in each case, a point of rotation. I will then take this translation only frieze, rotate it through that point, and once again I see that it's possible to get some very interesting friezes. At this point, it's very difficult to even make out what the original pattern was. Here's another example of 180 degree rotational symmetry. I'm going to choose these two points, rotate, and once again I get some very nice patterns. Now, if I want all possible symmetries, I'm going to start with one of the patterns where I've already introduced horizontal symmetry. Now, you'll recall that if we have both horizontal and vertical symmetry, then we must have all of them. So all I have to do is take these patterns and reflect them vertically through a chosen line. And again, I will choose four different lines in each of the cases, reflect the frieze vertically through that line, and I get some very elegant patterns. It's actually quite difficult to tell that it's clear that they're related, but it's a little bit more difficult to tell that one is just a shifted version of the other. Here's some more examples. I create a line, I reflect through that vertically through that line, and I get some very elegant patterns. Now, if I want translations and glide symmetries only, I'm going to again start with my translation only freeze, shift each of them over half a period, and in each case I will choose a line through which I will reflect them vertically. Having done so, I now satisfy both translational symmetry and glide symmetry without any of the other properties. If you want translational, glide and horizontal symmetries, as well as rotational symmetries, as before we're going to start with a pattern that has horizontal symmetry, we will shift it over half a period, 
and then in each case choose a line of vertical reflection, reflect the pattern, and we get some very nice looking friezes. So therefore in this topic we've covered friezes and the freeze symmetry groups. Friezes are used mostly for horizontal direct decoration and they have a surprisingly ancient past. In fact they form the oldest known deliberate work of human art. All friezes have translational symmetry but some friezes may also have horizontal glide symmetries, rotational symmetry, and vertical symmetry. The possible combinations of these give us seven symmetry groups. These we represented by the letters B, BD, BP, BQ, BD, PQ, the letters A and O. We then saw how we could take any pattern and convert it into a frieze satisfying the conditions of any one of these symmetry groups. So thank you for your time. Now when you come upon a building and see some a decorative frieze, you may be able to describe it mathematically. Most friezes are horizontally symmetric only. However, you may come across something a little bit more interesting. Those are some of the products used to prepare this talk. And remember to support the Waterloo Engineering Endowment Fund. Thank you for your time and have a good day.